world of everything. Hi, I'm Colin the Ed, and welcome to Colin the Ed's World of Everything, episode three. Today, we've come to Umber Bridge, here in Umberside. We're gonna see what Umber Bridge is all about. I'm Colin the Ed, this is Colin the Ed's World of Everything. Right, so the bridge itself is 2,200 metres long. The idea for the bridge was actually conceived in the 1930s, but the actual construction of the bridge did not actually even start till 1971. And in 1981, the bridge itself was opened by the Queen. When constructed, it was the longest single span suspension bridge in the world. So it actually took 10 years to actually construct. So for the whole Humber Bridge project, it took a whole entire 50 years from start to finish. On an average, 120,000 vehicles a week will use this single span suspension bridge here in Umberside. We just stood at the foot of the bridge. This is where the Umber Bridge starts. This is where the physical single span suspension bridge starts that crosses the River Umber. And this is the mountain point behind me. You can look behind me. This is solid steel. Solid steel suspension bridge and it's mounted behind me to this mountain point. Obviously, that mountain point is connected to the actual counterbalance weights behind me. These counterbalance weights and these this mountain point and this solid steel behind me here is actually supporting the umber bridge, is actually supporting the carriageway. And if you look behind me, we'll just, we'll just walk over here, solid steel tube is actually connected to these mounting points and it's solid I can just swing on it like that and it just won't move and these are actually supporting the actual bridge itself so this is the start of the Umber Bridge and that configuration is mirrored all the way across the bridge obviously it goes up, up to the first tower behind me and these metal rods steel rods should I say are supporting the actual carriageway and it's all suspended it's all suspended. We're going to have a walk over it now and see what else Umber Bridge got to offer us. Nice view, isn't it? Lovely view. We just stood here in the middle of Umber Bridge. So this is the centre of the single span suspension bridge. That is the Umber Bridge. And we're just here. And I mean, if you just take a look at how we are, I mean, it's got to be 100 foot above above actual Umber Estuary itself. Yo, it's pretty high. And how does this does this structure just stay here in all wind? Because when it gets windy, I mean, there's no wind. But I can imagine being up here in a, in a Force 10 gale. I mean, and all this metal, concrete, road, it just stays here suspended by the two massive solid steel ropes if you want to call them the actual whole bridge totally relies on them two solid steel ropes well they're not even ropes it's solid steel and obviously you can see these guide ropes that come down that support the actual carriageway that's the only thing that actually keeps this bridge intact is the simple fact that its weight obviously the weight of the carriageway is pulling against the high intensity cables above my head and obviously all the weight's being transferred into that tower behind me and then down to ground. So the whole structure is suspended. It's a single span suspension bridge and we're stood in the middle of it here at Umberside. Umber Bridge's got a lot to offer. It's not, it's not just a bridge. It's a tourist attraction. You can walk across it for absolutely nothing. It and cost us a thing to walk across this bridge. It's also got a visitor's centre, a large car park. And if you've never visited the Umber Bridge before, it's worth a day out. It is actually a day out for the tourist. It's not just a road bridge. There's a lot more to Umber Bridge than what you actually think. Before this bridge were actually constructed, for actual the residents of Hull to cross the actual Umber, they had two options. They either went down the M62 down M18 and back up M180 or they were actually a ferry, an actual car ferry before the actual construction at bridge and the only way to actually get across the actual River Umber at this point was to use the car ferry so before they actually built the Umber Bridge if you wanted to go from Hull to Scunthorpe you had to use car ferry so building this bridge was a vital thing, it was a vital artery across Umber Estuary well, I'm just stood here on Umber Bridge and I see some, some, of my, some of my fans down there. I'm just going to give him a shout. 
Hello! Hello! I'm Colin the Edge from Colin the Edge World of Everything! I'm waving at you! I'm Colin the Edge for... Hello, mate! Colin the Edge fan! It's absolutely awesome! So, we've just, we've just stood here at North Side at North Tower and we just look back over at Bridge and can actually see the actual shape of carriageway, how it actually arches over the actual lumber estuary. And in the distance there, you can see the South Tower and obviously you can see the suspension bridge but look how it just like leaps of a umber estuary the actual umber bridge itself leaps of a umber estuary but just here this is north tower or umber bridge this is north tower so this tower here is like keeping our umber bridge up obviously and you can see it's a very high tower something else we've found here is that we found this plaque on north tower no this triangular plaque and it actually says the civic trust award 1982 now the bridge itself was opened in 1981 so a year after the bridge actually opening the umber bridge got the civic trust award and there's a plaque on north bridge on north tower at umber bridge actually commemorating the actual award that was given to this colossal structure that exists here in umberside that crosses the river umber estuary fan this actually we just fan this and uh, obviously it's got wheels on it Looks like some out of a theme park or something. Um, but it's not. What it is, it's, it's, it's a gantry. And it's actually an, a maintenance gantry. So obviously, the underneath at bridge needs maintenance. All bridges need maintenance. And obviously, something as big as Umber Bridge will need a lot of maintenance. So, this here, this side of me, this cage, is a maintenance gantry. And obviously, it's got wheels. So, this will move all the way along under the carriage at bridge so if you look if you look below if you look our wheels are actually mounted to the side of the bridge so all that will move so obviously people will be on underneath doing maintenance work and this is how they maintain the umber bridge with the use of these maintenance gantries and obviously they move backwards and forwards and it'll be mirrored and you want the other side of the bridge as well and it'll be solely for maintenance purposes so that's how they maintain the Umber Bridge underneath of the carriageway with the use of these gantries. So behind me, as you know, the Umber Bridge is a toll bridge. You've got to pay a toll to go over Umber Bridge. Now behind me here, if you see this like a fair, these are the toll booths. Now if you come in onto the bridge from the south side, right, you'll find that there's no toll booth and there's nowhere to park. So you just railroad onto Umber Bridge. You haven't got a choice. You're on this dual carriageway that's going over Umber Bridge, right? So, so there's nowhere to park, you can't stop, right? So once you've gone over Umber Bridge, right? And you get to them toll booth and you've got no money, right? You've already gone over a bridge, they're having your money. You're railroaded. You, you haven't got a choice. You've got to pay the toll and no one is allowed to drive over this bridge if they've not paid the toll. Now this is what happens if you haven't paid your toll. So you're driving over Umber Bridge, right? And you've got no money and you can't pay your toll. So obviously the people who run Umber Bridge need some sort of payment off you. So what they do, they have you, they have you washing dishes in Umber Bridge Visitor Centre, which is just behind me down that hill. And you've got to do a full shift in there to earn your toll. One pound fifty a day. My advice is calling the top tick if you're coming to Umber Bridge and you want to drive over it, make sure you've got one pound fifty to do, to do one trip. You can look at these massive concrete blocks behind me, okay? Anyone would just think, oh God, it's just a concrete block. But no, they're not. They're actually counterbalance weights. Now these concrete stone blocks, stanchions, call them whatever you want, okay? But these are counteracting the weight for the suspension bridge. So obviously, the high tensity cables and the Umber Bridge is actually supporting the road are using this concrete as part of the counterbalance. So these are holding bridge up really in a sense, these are a really important part of the Umber Bridge construction. We just stood underneath the carriageway here and you can see how, how the actual carriageway is supported. Now this is the run up to the bridge. Obviously that concrete structure you can see at the back with the lights on, that's the counterbalance weight that I've mentioned earlier in the show. That's, that's the counterbalance that supports the, third, the start of the actual suspension bridge. Now this is just the run up to the suspension bridge and obviously you can see these concrete stanchions that are supporting the actual carriageway and there's three in total 
So there's three, six, there's nine actual concrete supports that support the actual carriageway on the run up to the counterbalance. It's just absolutely colossal and actual engineering that went into building this. You know, it took, it took 10 years to build this bridge. You know, it's a feat in engineering and it's right here in Umberside. And anyone can walk over it for now. Like I said earlier, the Umber Bridge has actually got a tourist visitor center. So it's, it's not just a, a road bridge, it's actually a tourist attraction. Now behind me, as you can see, that is the Humber Bridge Tourist Information Centre. And there's a guy in there called Simon, right? Now Simon's job is, is when you don't pay your toll to go over Humber Bridge, right? And them at toll booths up there, like, they'll ring Simon up in Tourist Information Centre and say, we've got a non-payer here, we've got a non-payer, right? And it's Simon's job to allocate your task for not paying the actual toll on the Umber Bridge. So your punishment for not paying the toll on the Umber Bridge is to do the dishes in the Umber Bridge Visitor Centre. So if you don't pay your toll, whether it's open or not, they've always got dishes and that. And this is where you come, this is actually punishment and that's all down to Simon in the Umber Bridge Tourist Information Centre. Now if you look just over my shoulder in the, in the Umber Bridge Tourist Information Centre, we can see Simon. That is Simon. An easy charge at Umber Bridge. His, 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 his job, right, for all non-payers, he, he, he allocates the jobs. That's just Simon, you know, in charge at Tourist Information Centre here at the Umber Bridge. <laughs> I'm Colin the Ad. Coming up next... E-Fags! Dead controversial! Colin the Ad world of everything. Excuse me, Colin. Oh, yeah? Can you put that cig out, please? This is a public building. Uh. Oh yeah, two minutes. Uh, let me just find somewhere to put it. Yeah, put it out now, please. I'll just, I'll just put it out here on the table. All right. Uh, all right then. Fair play. Uh, excuse me, Colin. I've just said you're not allowed to smoke in public. It's an e-fag. I'm not, I'm not causing any harm. Look, I'm just on the e-fag. E-fags, dead controversial. Are they bad for your health? These little e-fags are really popular. You know, they are an alternative to smoking or, as the actual manufacturers claim, a stop smoking aid. But, an e-fag, you know, are they better for you than a conventional cigarette? Obviously, they're not proven by good government. There's no actual government legislation to say that they're healthier than actually smoking a proper fag. This little device, this little vaporizer, what, what's it all about? So, obviously, you press this little button here if anyone has never used an e-fag, and there's obviously an heat element inside here to actually warm the liquid up and it turns into vapour. And what you're doing is you're vaporising this little button here, where you press that, and it warms up an eating element inside, and then you just inhale. Like that. There's a lot of controversy surrounding these e-fags. You know, what are you actually inhaling? The manufacturers are actually saying that it's safer than smoking, but is it? So if you don't smoke and you choose to smoke an e-fag, you're more likely to develop an addiction to nicotine through using an e-fag because the actual dosage on an e-fag is actually higher than a conventional cigarette. You're more likely just to have it in your pocket because you can smoke them anywhere. You can't smoke just anywhere in a public place. If you're in a public place, you can't have a cigarette, but you can have an e-fag. So obviously if you've got a nicotine addiction, you can, you can satisfy that nicotine addiction anywhere you want. The, the statistics say if you choose to smoke an e-fag with nicotine in it, you are more likely to develop a nicotine addiction through an e-fag. Through smoking an e-fag, is it a, a stop smoking aid or are you just feeding the actual nicotine addiction which you actually have as a smoker? You're smoking cigarettes, obviously you light a cigarette. The combustion, there's actually combustion there, you are physically lighting a cigarette. Now, these work a little bit different because there is no combustion actually involved, i.e. putting a light to it, putting a flame to it. What it does, the eating element vaporizes the actual liquid, so you're turning the liquid into steam, basically, and you're actually inhaling it. Now, I think these devices are a little bit late. Can you remember the smoking ban that were fetched in in pubs and clubs in 2007, July 2007? These were not a popular choice back then. If these had been available at the time, 
right, back in 2007, I do believe there would not have been as many pubs shut through the smoking ban. Because the smoking ban back in 2007 shut a vast amount of pubs, clubs and businesses in the UK due to the fact that people couldn't have a pint and just have a cig. You know what I mean? A pint and a cig go together. Coming up next in the show... We visited the medieval chapel here in Wakefield. Calling the edge world of everything. We're here in Wakefield, West Yorkshire, England. Now, we're outside the A638 and it's a main artery into Wakefield. It's a main A road that goes into Wakefield. Now, we're at a place that's known as Chantry Bridge and it's on the River Calder. This is the River Calder behind me. And obviously this is Chantry Bridge here. You can see all the cars going over the Chantry Bridge. And obviously it's a main artery. So when you're coming into Wakefield, obviously that's the new bridge and this is the old bridge. Now we're not bothered about new bridge, right? We're more bothered about this old bridge over here. And if you'll notice, there's a medieval chapel in the middle of it. And that chapel there behind me, it's a grade one listed building. So it's a medieval chapel here in Wakefield. Now, there's not many chapels like it in UK because it's in middle of bridge, in river. You know what I mean? It's just like, whoa, you know what I mean? Where else do you actually see a, a working functional chapel? In middle of a bridge. Now, there used to be four of these chapels. Every road that went out of Wakefield, right, there'd be one of these chapels. But this is the only one that actually exists to this day. There is actually four other places in the UK where you will find Chantry chapels like this one. And they are Bradford-upon-Avon, Rotherham, St Ives and Cambridge. You just drive into Wakefield and you just think, Oh, look at that chapel there in Midland Road, you know, in Midland Bridge. And it's just there. So what we're going to do now, I'm calling the Ed's world of everything, we're going to have a look at the Chantry Chapel here at Chantry Bridge in Wakefield. Now this bridge is actually 700 year old and this bridge was built over the River Calder here in Wakefield to replace the old wooden bridge that existed before it. I mean, you can obviously see how old this bridge is. I mean, look at them arches, look at the medievalness that's about them arches. And look, I mean, look at them buttresses, I mean, it's 700 year old for Christ's sake and it's still here doing its job. So we're just here at the St. Mary the Virgin's Chapel here in Wakefield. And we're at the, this is the west face of the chapel. Now, what is about the west face of this? This actual decorate decor you can see on front of this chapel here has actually been meddled with over the years and it's been replaced several times. You know what I mean? The light, they've refaced all the front of chapel for various reasons. The rest of the building is original. 1342, the actual original footings for this chapel were actually put here in 1342. And obviously, the front of the actual chapel itself is has been re, has been revamped and renewed, should I say, renewed like I said. And you can see Chantry Chapel, St Mary, on the bridge, Holy Communion is celebrated on the first Sunday of the month. Evening worship at 4.30pm. So that means there's still services here at this chapel in Middle of Bridge in Wakefield. You know, and it still actually happens and you would hardly believe it, would you? That this, this, this little church, I mean, it's not even big. I mean, it's, it's like a postage stamp or something. This little postage stamp that's in Middle of Wakefield, right? On the middle of this bridge, it's like an island and it's just situated here in Wakefield. I wonder if it's open. No, it's not open. It'd be good if it would though, wouldn't it? Hey, okay, let's have a look at this little church. So this is the River Calder in uh, February 2015. Here we are on Colin the Ed's world of everything on another bridge and we're just looking through the window, obviously chapel's not open so we can't go in and have a look, which is a shame. And if you can look at the actual decor, look at them faces, how much detail's in them faces. You know, they're just the gar gargoyles or something. I wonder who we are. I wonder, if, I wonder, I wonder who them, they, them people actually are. And uh, obviously if you look through the windows, this little window at the side with this first window, you can actually see that there's actually seating still inside church, you know, ready for services and stuff, ready for like 
ceremonies to take place and stuff. So it's actually still a functioning, fully functioning chapel. Wakefield Cathedral running nowadays. You know, we can see Wakefield Cathedral over there. The Wakefield Cathedral towering over the city landscape. Obviously they're in charge at Little Chapel that exists here in Little Chantry Bridge. The St Mary the Virgin's Chantry Chapel in Wakefield. It actually got two floors. It's not just a church on top. First floor, obviously, church and that, you know, altar and all that that goes with a normal Burnett Mill church. It's actually got a crypt underneath. And you can actually see behind me, if you look behind me, you can see Chantry Bridge there with its medieval arches, a river calder thundering underneath it, right? But there's actually a crypt underneath the actual chapel itself. Another thing I'm going to put, throw into this point is look how clean and how healthy River Calder looks today. You know, I can remember me when I was a young lad, you know, this river was dirty. You know, it's, it's come thundering down Pennine Hills. It's gone through Halifax. It's gone through Brighouse, textile places. And obviously all waste got chucked in the river. And they just, they just didn't care, they just used to chuck all waste in the river. So by the time the River Calder arrived in, in Wakefield, you know, it used to be a really, 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 really dirty, dirty river. And look at it today, the river, the river is actually recovering fine. I mean, look at them ducks just swimming about on top of water. You know, you know, the river is the river's good, the river's healthy. I'm amazed by it, you know, I'm quite amazed. And the reason why it's so special, the reason why we've come to this particular one, we could have gone to any other four that exist in country, but the one in Wakefield is the oldest of its kind in England. And it's also a grade one listed building. It's the first grade one listed building we featured in Colin the Ed's World of Everything. Coming up next, traffic lights. They're the governors of the road. Colin the Ed's World of Everything an important safety feature and we just drive past them every day. These traffic lights behind me are doing an important feature. The first traffic light was invented in 1868 and they were actually installed in London outside Houses of Parliament and there were gas traffic lights. And how they used to work these gas traffic lights is a police officer used to sit in the middle there were a gas powered light. What they used to do is they used to change filament. So obviously if you wanted it to be green, it'd have a green lens and it'd put green lens in front of like lantern. So this copper used to just sit outside Houses of Parliament in 1868 and change these filaments on these here traffic lights. This bridge behind me, that's River Went behind me, that's a little bridge. And it's a single track road. Obviously you can see these boring traffic lights behind me, right? But if it weren't for these traffic lights, right, there'd be some serious accidents. All these traffic lights are doing an important job. Right, Guthrie's there. It is in <laughs> Right, Guthrie from work, right, is in his focus, and he's just gonna go through Doggle Wall. There he goes, here goes Guffers. Guffers has been calling the end and world of everything. You might notice the road, right? When you come to like a set of traffic lights, they're not just timed, you know. People just think they're on a timer. So them lights are gonna stay red for a certain amount of time. No, you're wrong. So for people that don't know, them squares that you see on, on, on road into tarmac near a set of traffic lights are actual pressure sensors. You can see this we're in Midlock Road, right? This is the pressure sensor. So when a car's on this sensor here, right, it activates the traffic lights. Obviously, I'm not fat enough to set it off. You know, it just won't go off. But obviously, if a car rolls onto this square, right, it will activate the traffic lights. Best get out of the road quick before I get run over. Okay, this is Colin the Ed's World of Everything episode three. I'm Colin the Ed, thank you for watching. I hope to see you in the next episode of Colin the Ed's World of Everything, which will be coming soon, I do assure you. Bye! <laughs> Colin the Ed's World of Everything.